In this lesson, we're going to look at different solid types, uh, ionic, metallic, network covalent, polar molecular, and nonpolar molecular solids. Let's start off with ionic. In ionic solids, we have cations and anions uh, attracted to each other. They're going to arrange themselves in a crystalline form. Uh, these crystals can be very small to ones that you would need to have uh, to look at underneath a magnifying glass, or they could be huge, as shown in this picture from uh, National Geographic in a cave down in Mexico. <clears throat> All of those crystals, though, have the one thing in common, and that is that they are going to be, the ions are held in place with ionic bonds. The transfer of electron has occurred. Uh, you have the cation, the anion, and it's the attraction that's causing these ions then to be bonded together. They're going to arrange themselves in that crystalline form, and we end up with very high melting points and boiling points. Uh, the reason for this is that to melt or boil something, you literally are going to have to break those bonds, these ionic bonds that occur between the cations and anions, and that requires an extremely large amount of energy. The ionic compounds are not going to conduct electricity, there, is no, there are no free electrons that are available, and the ions are stuck in place. And to conduct electricity, we must have charged particles that can move around, and we don't have any of those in an ionic solid. Ionic compounds are also going to be very brittle. Uh, if you were to hit them with something, they're going to break or shatter. Uh, and there's another video that can, uh, will illustrate that. The next solid type are metallic solids. Now, metallic solids are where you have metals, or metal atoms are the only atoms involved, or they're going to be a majority of the atoms. With metallic solids, uh, they are also, like ionic compounds, going to form a crystalline structure. Uh, they're going to have a very uh, regular arrangement of those. In metallic solids, the metals are held together by what we call metallic bonds. Now, this is a little bit different than what we've seen so far. And you think of a metallic bond as something uh, a cross between covalent and ionic bonding. The model that we use for uh, describing metallic bonding is what we call the sea of electrons. And in the diagram off to the right there, we can see that we have these positively charged central cations, which would represent the nucleus and the electrons that are not valence electrons. And we've got the pink electrons, which represent the valence electrons that these metals have essentially lost. They've lost them to each other, and they've contrib they, they basically have contributed them to everybody else. So in a sense, the atoms have lost their electrons, but the electrons are being shared by all of those ions. Metals have high, they, they can range in their melting point and boiling points, but metals tend to have very, you know, fairly high melting points, hundreds of degrees, or even up into thousands of degrees. Uh, again, this is because of the very strong attraction that these ions have for all of these electrons. Uh, they want to be stuck to those, and that metallic bonding allows for that strong attraction, which would keep those metal atoms in place. The fact that the electrons can move around, though, also makes metals very good conductors, since they're not stuck in one place. And as I stated before, something to conduct electricity must have movable charged particles, and the electrons in this case are the things that move around. Metals are also malleable. Because the electrons can move around, if stress is applied to a metal, the cations, those, the, the nucleus that's positive, can slide back and forth between each other where the electrons are simply going to shift around and uh, adjust for any changes in attractions and repulsions. Our next type of solid is called a network covalent solid. And these compounds are uh, probably the most common one you're familiar with is a diamond. Uh, these are solids where they're, all the atoms are nonmetals. All of the atoms are bonded to each other, or the surrounding atoms are bonded to each other. So in animations you see off to the right, you see that the gray represents graphite. 
and you see the atoms are all bonded in what we, we would call layers, and this is what gives graphite some of its properties. Uh, when it gets to a certain point where you can see down between the layers, there actually is a bond between the layers uh, using the uh, p electrons that are in those p sublevels that have not been hybridized. With the diamond crystal, it's the one with the uh, ball and stick model that I have rotating around. <clears throat> each of those gray sticks represents a covalent bond, and each of the black uh, balls in the middle of those represent a carbon atom. And you can see that as, you, as it's rotated around, those bonds arrange themselves in a pattern. And those structures in a diamond would give you the different faces of a diamond. So when they cut a diamond, they're actually going to cut and break the bonds along those patterns that you see. The diagram you see down at the bottom uh, represents a quartz. Uh, quartz is made up of silicon and oxygen bonded together in a, an arrangement. And you see in the blow up, all of those uh, atoms are bonded to each other in a pattern. Network covalent solids have extremely high melting points. Uh, and boiling points, I put a question mark there because the temperatures are actually going to get so high before they be able to boil that the atoms are going to you know, lose their electrons. They would actually become plasma or they're going to vaporize and go straight from the solid, uh, sublime and go straight from the solid phase into the gas phase. So boiling point for many of these compounds is non-existent simply because of the energies involved. They're not going to conduct electricity. Because these uh, atoms are all held together by covalent bonds where the electrons are being shared, those electrons are not free to move around. And because they're not free to move around, and because they're not ions, like an ionic solid, they are neutral atoms, there are no charged particles for to the electricity to be conducted. Uh, and as you have probably observed before with quartz, which is a form of rock, or even diamonds, they are brittle, they can shatter. If you were to hit these with a hammer, they're going to break apart into small little pieces. The first of our molecular solids would be our polar molecular solids. The best example that, we, uh, that you're familiar with of this is ice, and that's what's represented on the diagram off to the side. Uh, as sh the name implies, the molecules are going to be made up of polar molecules, and those polar molecules are going to be attracting each other using those dipole-dipole forces. In the diagram that I have over on the right, the water molecules are represented by attracting each other with the yellow lines, which represent that dipole-dipole force. If they're polar and the conditions are right, uh, those polar bonds are going to arrange themselves so that you do get a crystalline pattern. And in terms of melting point and boiling point, these are going to be moderate to low. Uh, ice tends to have ice is going to have a melting point of zero degrees Celsius. Uh, we're getting to the point here where the think the forces of attraction holding these molecules in place are intermolecular forces, and intermolecular forces are significantly weaker than covalent and ionic bonds and even metallic bonds, which the first three types of solids had. Molecular solids are not going to conduct electricity, again, because there are no charged particles involved that can, be, that can conduct the electricity. A nonpolar molecular solid is going to be a solid that's made up of nonpolar molecules. Uh, and because of this, we really don't have any specific structure to the molecules. Uh, in the video off to the right, we see that's some silly putty. And a silly putty technically can't be classified as a true solid, but for this example, we can use that. Uh, the silly putty over time in that video is actually 12 minutes condensed down and think about 10 or 12 seconds. You can see that that silly putty had deformed. Um, and the reason why is because the forces of attraction in silly putty are our London dispersion forces. And most nonpolar molecules are gonna, that are solid are going to be like this. Candle wax is another example. If you were to heat that up, it's going to start to deform. Um, other nonpolar solids are going to have similar properties. The higher the temperature gets, the, the less they're going to hold their shape.
in terms of melting points and boiling points, they are going to have really low to only moderately high, although some can have very high uh, boiling points. Most of them are going to have moderate to low melting points. An example of an extremely high boiling point polar substance would be to have uh, oils, uh, vegetable oil, for example. The boiling point for that is extremely high. That's why we can use it to cook with. Uh, but its freezing point, or where it would melt, is really, really low. Uh, that's why on a shelf it's a liquid phase. It would take a fairly low temperature before you got to the point where it would freeze into a solid. So nonpolar solids are going to have these, they're, they're going to have to have a low temperature to have them a solid. Or the London dispersion forces are going to have to be very, very strong to have them solids at room temperatures.